Good afternoon and welcome to Field Trip Moon. I'm Carter Emart, I'm the Director of Astro Visualization for the American Museum of Natural History. And today we're going to go back to the moon and we're going to see where we explored, what we learned, and where we're going in the future. And that future, for those of you who are younger, is your future. And so we're very excited about this. We're starting off today with a view of the moon over the Grand Canyon, our beautiful national park out in Arizona. Joining me today is Jackie Faraday, astronomer, astrophysicist, and friend at the American Museum of Natural History. Jackie. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'll be joining Carter today. And uh, I'm an astronomer at the museum. I do research at the museum, but I'm also an avid space fan. And I love everything about the moon. And so today, I'm going to be both giving a little bit of insights with Carter, but most importantly for you to know this now, I'm going to be going through the chat, taking your questions. And I'd love it if you mention your names, maybe your age, where you're from, and we can give you a shout out throughout this live presentation since we're flying live and we're doing all sorts of things for you live. And so we wanna give you the shout out that you deserve. So one, uh, one year ago, Micah and I were out in Flagstaff, Arizona and we both went to um, the Grand Canyon. Micah is our pilot today. Micah Achinapura is one of our developers for open space, this software that visualizes data. So this is an image from a satellite of Earth. Let's leave the Earth now, Micah. We're gonna climb up through the atmosphere here and, um, and travel to the moon. So this is the moon phase that we can see. And if you had a clear morning, um, you, might, uh, you might be, some of you may be surprised if we can actually see the moon during the day. And when it's uh, between sort of um, last quarter as we're seeing here or first quarter, uh, moon phases that, uh, and when it gets sort of closer to the sun, we, we can see it in the, in the daylight through the atmosphere of the Earth, which we're going through now. Our atmosphere is only about 20 miles thick. It's very thin compared to the size of our planet. And as we come out, uh, you know, we, we see the stars uh, out here in space as the Earth sort of shrinks away. So Mike is going to pilot us to the moon, and we're going to look at how we see the moon. And um, I just want to note that the first thing that uh, um, astronomers uh, have known for a long time is the moon is gray. And uh, of course the earth is, is blue and we see the clouds and continents of earth. The earth is, we've talked about this in a, in a previous field trip, um, the beauty of the stars and the universe beyond, but we're gonna peer over to see the moon and also there's a line coming in which shows that the moon orbits the earth and it orbits um, at uh, a quarter million miles away. That's 1000 times the distance of the International Space Station. And we had gone to the moon in the Apollo program uh, 50 years ago, but the moon is one quarter the size of earth. So one fourth the diameter of earth. Being smaller, it has less gravity. And that has a lot to do with the fact that we don't see an atmosphere on the moon. There's not enough mass to hold an atmosphere. What we see are these um, dark areas, these dark features of the moon. And as we get close now, this would be equivalent to sort of looking through a telescope at the moon. Mike is gonna bring us around from the familiar earth facing side that has all these dark areas. We now know that they are lava flows. And we know that because when we went to the moon, Michael, let's come around to the far side of the moon. So this dividing line that we see here between the darker gray smooth areas and the sort of mountainous terrain that we're now seeing is, is also sort of the dividing line between on the right, what faces the earth. The moon is what we call tidally locked. It always it has a one face that faces us. And we didn't see the far side of the moon that we're now seeing, we're passing over a young impact basin, like a very big crater. We see lots of holes. These are craters. These are impact craters from asteroids falling in on the moon. That's something we don't see so much of on Earth. And over here is the far side. And uh, Mike, oh, we see the Earth just coming through the lower right there. But um, this is the far side of the moon. And notice it's heavily cratered. All these holes, again, are basically caused by infall of large meteors or large asteroids falling into the moon. 
this Parker, as we're, oh, we're yes. over here too, we're getting a great question from PS24 in the Bronx, which is mm -hmm. on temperature on the moon. So it looks pretty oh. cold. Maybe you could remind us how cold it is. Yes, because our atmosphere insulates us. Micah's uh, just turned on sort of the, a global illumination so that we can see the whole moon. And um, there we see the sun coming in on the right, but uh, otherwise we'd be on sort of the night at the moon. But yes, the extremes without an atmosphere means that when you're just sort of in the sunlight, it's many hundreds of degrees, uh, sort of, uh, it's very hot and your spacesuit has to insulate you. Whereas if you go into shadow, it's very, very cold. And so that temperature extreme is hundreds of degrees. And um, so we have our atmosphere, thanks to our larger size of the world we live on, having an atmosphere and supporting liquid water, which is, of course, we're the water planet uh, on Earth, and, and that uh, uh, water is common to all of life that we know of. And we only know of life in one place on the Earth. So when we got to the moon, we saw, and up close, we could see all these craters, and we could see these, you know, this, this gray of the moon, and it's all rock. And so, well, you know, we went to the moon to, uh, to learn about it. And, and so uh, we're gonna show you now where we went. And uh, so this, this difference between the moon on one side being very cratered and this side being um, filled with lava and very large craters. You, you can see actually sort of, uh, Mike has brought up now our landing sites of Apollo. These are uh, the only people to have gone to the moon are in these six missions, so 12, men went to the moon in Apollo, Americans, and, uh, but we were also other nations. Uh, we were in a space race with the Soviet Union at the time, what's now Russia, and Russia also landed. Um, so, um, but I actually, I should emphasize, uh, let's bring up the flags. So we'll bring up uh, the locations. This is where the Russians had landed. But I also want to bring up, um, uh, before we bring up, there's some more flags because other nations went, but I want to show you where our robotics went before we landed people. And so we're going to bring up um, some icons of where our robotic uh, landers went. These are the surveyors. And uh, so these surveyors map out this zone across the moon. It's, it's sort of the equator on the moon. And this is sort of the easiest place to get to. And you notice that they're all sort of in the smooth areas. And these were precursors to landing people. And so the surveyors uh, allowed us to see uh, where the safety and landing is. So Parker, we before we move on in this too, we're getting some questions about life on the moon. And just as especially a great one from four-year-old Jonah, did anything ever live on the moon? And we should remind people that no one's ever lived on the moon that we know of, um, and that you're gonna soon be talking about our goal of returning to the moon, but these yeah. missions, no one was ever living there. So no, and that's a good, that's a very good question. In fact, early observers thought, you know, were these dark areas oceans? And so we, they adopted the term mare, which is Latin for, uh, for sea or for ocean. And so, we talk about uh, the ocean of storms and the sea of rains, the sea of tranquility. And that sea or that, that notion uh, was based on thinking maybe these were, maybe this was water out there, maybe there was life. But we now know where there's no um, liquid water and there's no atmosphere, it's hard for life. So we, we see that and all the rocks we brought back were sterile and so uh, we saw no life. So these are the, the Apollo landings. I'd like to also uh, just turn on for uh, briefly the Chinese uh, landing site on the near side. We're going to show you another Chinese landing site briefly uh, or and, and, and shortly, but uh, if we could turn that on. We'll see where the Chinese landed more recently. We went to the moon with Apollo about 50 years ago, and uh, the last Soviet landing was in 1976, uh, the U.S. bicentennial year. But a few years ago, China landed up here in the uh, in, the, in Mari Imbrium, the um, Sea of Rain, and uh, so uh, very successful. Not only a lander, a um, it also had a rover called Jade Rabbit, and so uh, the rover came out and did some investigations. No rocks were sent back, but um, let's now go. I want to take us to Apollo 17. 
And uh, so Mike is going to bring us around to our last landing site on the moon. Apollo 11, yeah. you can see the emblem with the wings. That's uh, Eagle. And uh, they landed in, of course, the Sea of Tranquility. And when we landed, we brought rocks back. And so the rocks, we could date how old they are. And we found that uh, um, the smooth areas are actually a lot, um, are a lot younger than the cratered areas we see uh, by almost a billion years. So we think these large, in, um, large lava fields are very large craters that got filled with lava from when the moon was younger and warm inside and that lava welled up. So we're gonna come in now to our last landing site on the moon. This was perhaps saving the best for last in a way. Um, Apollo 17 landed uh, in this area. It was very important between the lava fields that we see and we sort of see dark lava fields and then also um, the highlands or the mountains of the moon. So the mountains that we're gonna see here were thrown up at the very edge of Mare Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity. And um, so these mountains are quite tall. In fact, uh, Harrison Schmidt, uh, who was the only uh, scientist astronaut to go to the moon um, with Commander Gene Cernan on this last mission, points out that these mountains, in fact, that one at the bottom of the screen there, it's called the South Massif, the South Mountain, is actually taller than the depth of the Grand Canyon where we started. We actually see light mantle that um, comes off that mountain across the valley floor, and we see tiny craters. There are craters on the moon that are so big that uh, they're filled with lava like we saw, but then we see craters smaller and smaller and smaller. And all these craters are because, well, how come we don't have them on Earth? We have an atmosphere on Earth. And so when uh, asteroids and meteors sort of hit the Earth, they tend to burn up in the atmosphere. And then if they make a crater on Earth, erosion, because of our atmosphere again and rain, erases them. Mike is coming into where we landed. Hey, Carter, but before we get yes. too far into that too, we're getting lots of questions about the craters. And sure. one of which I think, um, I don't think we have an answer for, but I want to throw it out there, which is how many times has the moon been hit by a rock and whether or not we could answer that question with any reasonable number. Well, um, it, it's, it's actually, it's a, very, it's a very good question. The moon continues to be hit by rocks. In fact, when we have a meteor shower on Earth and see uh, lovely meteors uh, coursing across, shooting stars across our sky, we can actually see flashes on the moon where they're hitting and a large explosion is happening. These are not very large craters, but if you have the bigger the, bigger the rock, the bigger the uh, crater, and the, and the, the more high energy the event. Mike has brought us down to, we can actually see what we left on the moon in Apollo 17. This image is thanks to the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which uh, launched in 2009. What we can see in the middle of the screen is part of the lunar module. This is the descent stage, so the, the landing legs, essentially, and the fuel. We can also see there's a light uh, area around the lander because it blew the dust out of the way. But as we get closer, we can actually see the tracks. We can see the foot trails, essentially, that the astronauts left. And if you look really close, you might be able to see the parallel tracks of the rover. The last three missions to the moon, there were six. The last three brought rovers to the moon, a car, so the astronauts could drive far away and look at geologic sites of interest. So what we see is the lower stage, and we see the shadow extending off to the right. So that, and also it gets a little fuzzy in here because this picture is taken from 60 miles away, which is the altitude that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter orbits the moon, continuously photographing it. Mike is going to uh, now, can we augment this, Micah, with a, a map of just this, this area? Because I want to point out to the left, the scientists put up a whole bunch of scientific experiments. And so we can see that it's a lot brighter. And the ALSEP that we see, that's Apollo Lunar Scientific, scientific Experiment Package. They put a lot of, uh, they put um, uh, geophones, and that's basically like a little seismometer. They're going to measure the shake of the moon. And the top part of the, the spacecraft, they brought the astronauts back. Once they got in the capsule to come back to Earth, they crashed the top of the lunar module into that big mountain we saw, and it shook the moon. And we could 
use the shake to actually measure the sort of layering underneath. So great. As we pull Carter, back, but before we leave too much on this too, um, yeah. we, we're getting <laughs> questions about astronauts, including whether you're an astronaut, and I'll let you answer that. But um, important to this, uh, Leora and Josh from Westport are asking how many people have been on the moon. I'll let you answer both of those, but I do want to say that at this point, there have been no women on the moon, and we're hoping that that is going to change in the very, very near future. So Carter, why don't you go ahead and answer, sure. A, are you an astronaut, and B... Um, so no, I'm not an astronaut, um, although um, building this uh, open space software allows us all to be astronauts in a way, and, and really sort of explore with this field of what we call visualization, and the look at the actual data Micah, could we bring up the map of uh, the um, the where the rover drove? We'll we'll see the whole map. What's that? Oh, and, uh, yes. And so I uh, there's another question I didn't answer, which is how many people have been on the moon? It's it's only six people have been on the moon. There were six. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, twelve people. There were six missions, uh, six Apollo missions, each carrying two astronauts. Um, and so we can now see the valley of Taurus Litro here, and it's about seven miles wide. And if we, if we pan off to the left a little bit, we'll see the longest drive um, that was ever attempted on the moon, um, driving about uh, five miles away uh, to the base of the big mountain. And they also had to drive across a ridge um, called the Lee Lincoln Scarp. And we believe that there was a fault, there was a moonquake that raised this ridge, shook the mountain, caused that light material, the light mantle you see it's listed, came down like a landslide across the valley. And then on the north side, we also see some interesting things. As I want to uh, quickly take us to the last drive on the moon was uh, they went over to the North Massif and we can target an area that was called Station 6 and um, where they uh, encountered a boulder that was loosened off the mountain and rolled down. Now, what the astronauts were investigating and the reason they went here was that they wanted to get samples both from the mountains, which are much older, as well as the younger lavas. So that way uh, we could learn that uh, the sort of uh, process of what formed this valley, that uh, the mountain was thrown up with the collision um, that uh, formed these mountains. Um, and uh, about a billion years later, almost, that uh, these lavas filled in. So the, the valley floor is much younger than these rocks. So as we get closer, we can see a track. In other words, there's a line. This, this, uh, at Station 6, there's a rock, and that rock rolled down from farther up the North Massif, the North Mountain. So, Micah, let's come in close. We have an inset here, a little inset map, which is uh, the highest resolution possible. And in that map, uh, basically, we, we have a little scale. The width of, of the number six is about 30 meters, um, and that's about 100 feet. So let's zoom in now. And as we get closer, we'll see a, a few labels. The important one is LRV, stands for Lunar Roving Vehicle. That's the car or the little dune buggy electric dune buggy that they drove around on the moon. And the astronauts got out and took pictures on the sunlit side. As, uh, and so we're going to come up close here to the rock, these rocks. And so they, they documented, they took lots of pictures. And only recently, um, we could take those pictures and uh, use a process called photogrammetry to actually put that together so we can recreate the three-dimensional form. So we, we have 3D models here based on images and based on something called image processing. And that allows us to see the rocks properly scaled and with all the sort of 3D nature of the rocks. And um, Mike is gonna pan over to the one on the left. And as we do, we can see that you look at the rocks here, they're fairly consolidated. And, um, but if we pan over to the left, we'll see that uh, there's a difference in rock type and uh, um, alludes to um, a, a different type of rock. Samples were brought back and we could see that indeed two different rocks. This one here on the left 
uh, has a lot more holes in it. So we know it's kind of a lava rock. And so gas is formed in the lava. And the other rock um, was formed by an older um, piece of rock that uh, was more consolidated. Actually, now down below the rock, you can see two footprints from Jack Schmidt, uh, Harrison Schmidt, the geologist. And so you can see his boot prints actually in the soil. And, um, Carter, um, in, in looking yeah. at the rocks, we're getting lots of nice questions about the rocks too. I also want to give shout outs to Rye Middle School Earth Science class that's on here, since this is a big topic in your Earth Science class, geology and looking at rocks. And they're asking about seeing where the rocks, if lunar rocks that have been brought back to Earth, where they could find such things. And we should definitely mention that we do have lunar rocks at the American Museum of Natural History on display that you could see. We have a beautiful uh, sample uh, from Apollo 15 um, and uh, that landed also in a type of valley and they had the car to get around. Um, and, um, but yes, these, these types of rocks you could see, if you went to Hawaii, you would see uh, lava rocks like this, volcanic rocks. Now, um, uh, so we'll, we're gonna move away from here. We're gonna take a sort of more global view um, but also, Jackie, you mentioned uh, your students. Um, this work to actually make the 3D model um, was uh, by uh, my student Shem last year, um, an intern uh, that we had uh, from the Bergen County Academy School in Hackensack, New Jersey. And uh, those students are very good and, and uh, it's been very nice to uh, have them as interns. So we're going to now move away um, from this Apollo site and uh, we wanted, we briefly looked at the moon uh, as, we, as we came in. But, uh, and, and also you're seeing many lines here, these parallel lines that are sort of equal elevation going up the sides of the mountain. And we see the tracks, we see the labels of, of everything here. But, um, so I, I've already talked a little bit about what we've learned uh, with the moon and um, that, uh, that, that the younger parts are these lava flows. Also, uh, we, we looked uh, that the far side of the moon is, is filled with craters, not like the near side. We didn't see the back to the far side of the moon until 1959. And the first uh, um, country to get a picture of the back side of the moon um, was, was actually the Soviet Union. And uh, so as, as we pull out here, I'd like to um, just uh, before we, um, well, you know, see the entire moon. I'd like to turn on two flags of uh, uh, two other countries that um, have also recently attempted to reach the moon. And um, so Israel uh, most recently uh, had a lander in the last few seconds, didn't quite make it. But also some of you may know that uh, India also attempted to land on the moon. And uh, India with uh, one of its uh, orbiting satellites actually discovered ice at the, uh, at the uh, poles of the moon and uh, mainly the, the so uh, southern pole. And so um, these are very interesting discoveries and just illustrating that many countries are going back to the moon. And Jack, I want to, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I know you, you wanted to point out about, uh, about Israel and, and how that got started. Yeah, so that map of Israel that we're seeing there in that location, part of why I hope this inspires and gets people so excited is that that was all incentivized by what was called the Google Lunar X Prize, which was a competition to incentivize private companies to get out there and, and create a vehicle that could launch, go to the moon and take some pictures. And they had a pretty high monetary prize for this, something like $30 million. And no one won it because no one could do it in the proper amount of time. But that map shows you what the team IL or the, the Israeli team, which is a private company, got almost nearly accomplished the goal of sending a um, sending a payload, a package with a rover in it that almost made it down to the surface. So if nothing else, this should inspire all the young people watching. I know we have so many. This is Haspad from Memorial High School. I've seen your shout out. Maybe you have some aspiring engineers that want to help create some lunar vehicles for the future, because there's a lot of interest in doing that. So you may have noticed that uh, everything we, we've showed you as far as exploration of the moon, uh, like landing there, 
has been on the si this side of the moon that faces us. And, uh, and so uh, I, there are a couple things here. Why is that? Well, because that's in direct radio communication with the Earth. And on the far side, um, the moon shields us from radio communication, but the Chinese have recently landed there. And uh, um, that uh, there were originally plans that maybe one of the Apollo missions might go there. But to do that, the Chinese had to put a satellite out beyond the moon to relay uh, back um, uh, the landing, and it was successful. But um, in order to, um, you know, why did they land on the backside of the moon? One of the reasons was a recent discovery after Apollo from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And so uh, what we want to do now is look at the moon it, the way scientists look at it with a new, a, a different way of representing it. And, and we're going to show you here coloration, a colored moon by elevation. So in other words, we're going to show you um, basically coloration is sort of a rainbow scheme from blue um, that's low and where it's high, it's um, you know, sort of yellows and greens. And so now we can see these large uh, areas that were gray. We can see that they are low and, we're, and that they're smooth. Micah, could we move around to the far side? And when we do, we're going to, to see how um, the, the moon has, uh, again, this difference between what faces the Earth and, and what's on the other side. We call this being tidally locked. And we believe that uh, this part of the moon that faces us, this hemisphere of the moon that faces us, is uh, the lavas uh, indicate that, uh, because the moon was hit on all sides, but that the crust was thinner uh, on the side that ended up facing the Earth. And so being hit by these large impacts and the early uh, young warm moon that the lava flowed out, uh, filling um, these holes. And then uh, the, uh, we, we now know by techniques of looking very closely at the cratering record and everything, that what we see now facing us, Mare Oriental, it's the youngest of the impact basins because it's so fresh. Can you see radially lines that go out? These are boulders that were thrown out by that big impact, multiple rings. And then in the very center, there are very few craters, if any, uh, that sort of lay on that, that lava in the middle. Carter, I want to also just... Oh, okay. just coming around to the backside, I wanted to point out, Jackie, that the discovery that was made by representing the moon in this way is this basin on the far side, completely covered with craters, but by images, we couldn't detect it. We, we needed this elevation from a laser altimeter on, on, the, um, on the lunar reconnaissance orbiter to find this new discovery. Yes, Jackie, sorry. Yeah, so folks are noticing that there are more craters on this side. And I, I wanted to, to emphasize a point that you're alluding to, but you're being very careful in your language by calling it the far side. And I'll just say people often <laughs> miscall it the dark side of the moon as if it gets no sunlight. And Carter has said it multiple times, but I'm going to repeat it too for the chat um, that it gets plenty of sunlight. We should never call it the dark side. We're being very careful in calling it the far side versus the near side, um, as it's just that we never see the far side of the moon. And, and so that's, I'm saying it many times because okay. I want everybody on this chat to remember it for the future. <laughs> so there's a dark side of earth, it's called night. <laughs> this is usually- That is an is excellent say. point. <laughs> so, so we're coming into and uh, we're, we're approaching this South Polar Aiken Basin. We now know that this was where the moon was. Perhaps we saw Mare Oriental, which is the youngest of those impact basins. But this is perhaps the oldest because it has so many craters on top of it. And we're coming up to Von Karman Crater. And I'd like uh, Micah to turn on another flag. This is this is the uh, um, the. The, the most recent landing on the moon. And this is where the Chinese landed. Uh, this is Chang'e 4. Uh, Chang'e 3 was uh, the one that had Jade Rabbit, the rover, that landed on the near side. But um, so we don't need to see the flag. And Mike is going to actually bring us right up to it. So hey, Carter, as we come down, can you remind everybody what the colors mean since 
if folks yeah. are okay. I will. I will. Re, I will I'll just remind us that uh, that the blue and the darker blues are are lowest, and the yellows and greens are the highest. And so we're seeing this sort of uh, rainbow color scheme uh, attached to elevation. So the higher the mountain, um, we're used to seeing snow on top of mountains here. Just think of those lighter colors, meaning the, the height of the mountains. This black and white strip, again, this is a sort of natural color of the moon is gray, but Mike is gonna actually bring us right up. Remember we, we saw the lunar module um, or the, the base of the lunar module of Apollo 17 on the moon. Well, um, uh, on the other side, on the near side of the moon, um, the Chinese in landing Chang'e 4 also with an, its own little Jade Rabbit 2 um, lander that came down is actually a fairly small uh, uh, spacecraft successfully landed and, um, but the lunar module is about 30 feet with its legs spread open. Um, and so it, it, as it sat on the moon, about 30 feet. And um, whereas uh, this uh, particular lander is only about three feet wide and so much smaller. So it makes looking for it harder to do. Um, but um, but the, uh, the team from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter looked at where um, the, uh, uh, the landing camera, which again, the, the, as, as this landed on the moon, it had to be relayed, its signal relayed to a satellite, relayed back to Earth, and it sent in a movie so we could see which craters and so forth. And then Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter flew over and Micah has it dead center in the screen. Now, the craters are like little bowls with, and they're, they're sunlit, so we see them as little pits in the moon. And right in the center, you see a dot with a shadow extending off to the right. The pits or the little bowls of the craters um, show that the sun would be to the left. And they, they, so they cause a little shadow in the bowl. And then on the right side of the craters, we see it illuminated. So right there is, um, is Chang'e 4. And there's a little dot just up above it too. And that's the rover. That's, that's U2 or Jade Rabbit 2 conducting operations. That, Inside this lander is also a biological experiment where um, they successfully germinated or, or the uh, um, um, cotton seeds, they had rapeseed, they had um, also yeast and fruit flies. And unfortunately the thermostat on board failed. And so when they went into lunar night, it got too cold and, and the experiment died. They were taking these there to see about farming on the moon because in the future, Chinese astronauts called Taikonauts are planning to go to the moon just as American astronauts are planning and, um, and nations of uh, astronauts from various nations will probably be going to the moon soon. So where would we be going if we're going back to the moon? And this is a, this is a hot topic right now because within the next few years, we may be going back circling the moon with astronauts but certainly we're looking forward to landing on the moon. And for those of you who are younger, who are listening today, this is your future. And if you decide to become an astronaut or scientist, you may be going to where they're talking about going. So we're going to pull away now. And Carter, uh, we've got to, on this, this point too, because we're pulling away, so this might be a good moment to discuss this. Gabby Torsio asked a really, Awesome question. What parts of the moon have been unexplored or explored? And I love that because we are flying over the moon and we do look like we have detail, but it's such a small fraction of the moon that we've ever actually touched a foot upon, walked around, grabbed something. So um, you can speak to this as well, but I would say very, very little of the moon has actually been explored. Well, from I, I was just going to mention as well, and that's a very good question, um, because it was because we discovered this basin on the far side that motivated the Chinese to, to go there scientifically to explore it, other than just the technology needed of landing on the far side and the relay satellite and all that. But yes, imagine coming to Earth and landing in six places and saying, oh yeah, well, I've explored Earth. And you land in all the boring places that are nice and flat, you know, so you, you wouldn't land in the Grand Canyon. Um, 
So um, three of the landing sites uh, that we went to were kind of on the, the flatter side just to make sure it was safe. But then we, we, we really got good with landing on the moon so that we went to the mountains areas. Mike is gonna bring us now to the South Pole of the moon. And you say, wow, South Pole, we have the South Pole on earth and the North Pole on earth and they both have ice and so forth. Well, it wasn't until um, really the, uh, the, the, the mission from India um, had evidence that uh, there was ice at the poles of the moon. We didn't think that the moon had any water and ice is just frozen water. Micah, what I'd like to do is, could we fade up the image of the moon? That, that uh, we were looking at a picture um, that uh, are the images and then this is sort of a data map, but I wanna kind of blend those um, because this will illustrate the lighting at the pole. Now, the moon does rotate but it's locked to the earth. So as the moon revolves around the earth, it rotates. So Micah, if we could bring up that, that image map um, just for a moment, it will show the lighting. And this is the difficulty. Now this map is made by taking many, many pictures and sticking them together you know, like a big puzzle. And when we do that, the moon is always lit at the very edge when we get down to the pole. So this is a, a set of pictures. So blending these two maps together as Mike is doing, is sort of a good way to kind of see where we are because if we just look with these long shadows, it gets difficult. Right at the bottom of the moon is a crater called Shackleton named after the South Polar Explorer. He was a hero because while his ship was crushed by the ice, um, he had quite an adventure, you can read about it, in saving every member of the crew and um, by uh, going off in a little rowboat and uh, quite a journey to the nearest island to get a rescue team. So in his honor, this crater, Shackleton, is very interesting because the rim of the crater we can see illuminated by the sun. Micah, let's get in real close here, but in the pit of the crater, it's in permanent shadow. And this and other permanently shadowed areas we now know have ice. And um, so this is a place to go. Why do we want ice? Well, we can melt ice to make water and we are beings of life and life needs water. So we need water. But there's another thing too, bringing rocket fuel from earth and launching it from earth needs a big rocket because earth is so big, has lots of gravity. Moon has much less gravity. It's one sixth the gravity when you're on the moon. So you could jump six times higher. Um, and what would it look like to live on the moon? This is what it would look like down here. There are serious, NASA is seriously looking at this as a base and also a destination for the Artemis program, which um, Apollo was named after the god of the sun. But Apollo's twin sister is Artemis, and she uh, rules the night. She's the goddess of the moon. And um, most likely, uh, I was, so the astronauts who are training are a mixed crew of men and women, as Jackie pointed out, which is only appropriate. And um, so uh, perhaps our next astronaut to touch the lunar surface will, will be an American woman. So Carter, on this too, since we're- Chinese. <laughs> I, I want the, um, the audience, which definitely looks like we've got a lot of young kids right now watching, look at these images, have, ha, imagine yourself standing in this spot and looking around. And we see the earth behind us, which is really great. And I want to, so that, that's, I, hey, Jackie, how about if we run time so we can actually see, you know, um, what happens if of the view of Earth? Because the Earth is right on the edge. It's at, at, at the equator, at, at the South Pole. And Sorry, I, I, I cut you off a little bit. It would, be, it would be nice. We can answer this question too from Sophia Tizio, sure. um, who, who wants to know, rightly so, with proper equipment, could we live on the moon and for how long? And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good, great question that a lot of people are thinking about right now. So why don't we, we can turn time on and Carter, you can take a stab at that, that question. Wait. What's really good about that question is that, you know, if we have to bring everything from home, then it's sort of like going on a camping expedition. But if you're a pioneer, you go out and, you know, you don't just have a tent. What you have is you have to build a house. 
And so uh, pioneers uh, cut down trees and, and, and built a log cabin. Micah is cranking time up here so that we see the Oh boy, okay. So, um, but the, uh, the idea of going, you know, to, uh, to the moon, I, I think we, we had a crash, but I'll just continue uh, answering that wonderful question because we need to have the resources of the moon and uh, to build on. And um, so uh, we may build our house uh, underground on the moon. Um, that's another topic, but uh, there's solar radiation and cosmic radiation. Um, but know, also if we, have, if we have water on the moon, then we don't have to bring it from earth. So living off the land means that we can live there indefinitely. And yes, so resources would be a big thing, and that is really going to make a difference on sustainability. So as Carter points out, Shackleton Crater there, and the ability to have uh, ice get water. We had a great question as well um, from Sina. I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name right. Shira Vastava about when people go to the moon, do they use up all their fuel? If so, how are they getting back? So as we're kind of redoing open space here, you can also how long it takes to get to the moon and then takes to get back. Cause I love that. that yeah, aspect. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's one really nice thing about uh, um, the proximity of the moon. And that even though the moon is a quarter million miles away that um, when you go to the moon um, and the way we went with Apollo it only took about three and a half days to get to the moon which meant that in about a week, we had enough you know, fuel and supplies and food and protection that uh, you know, for one week, uh, we figured that uh, we can do it. And um, so getting there, you know, about three and a half days, um, with the Apollo astronauts, the longest mission, Apollo 17, spent three days on the moon and, um, and then had to come home because you, know, you, you use up your resources. In landing on the moon, um, calculated I, I think, you know, just how much. Oh, well, Jackie, I just wanted to answer that. You know, when landing on the moon, we you you calculate exactly how much fuel you're going to need with a little reserve, so that you get there, and then you have a separate fuel um, to launch you off the moon to rendezvous with the return ship and then come home. So, sorry, Jackie. Please. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's okay. We're. Um... We're going to have to end the program in a minute or so, but Micah's got us back here. I wanted to make sure I also promote for folks that this is the moon. Next week, we're going to be doing a program that's going to take us even beyond this. Um, I think we should have a beautiful closing moment here, but you should also, if you like these field trips, tune in next week as we're going to take you even beyond the Earth. We're talking a lot about exploration of the solar system. We're going to take you beyond exploring much more than just the solar system out into the stars and beyond next week as well. Yeah, and um, so it, it, because this this atlas, all the stars you see are three dimensional and, and placed in there and and, and uh, open space is a way to really see that. Micah has amped up time here. I just wanna leave this. This would be the view if you were living at Shackleton Crater and notice how we see the earth change shape in the same way we see the moon change shape. And that's because of the illumination of the sun. And so what's about to happen is the sun's gonna come in from the right and the earth becomes a crescent. And then perhaps even a, an eclipse from there. And then the earth will become a crescent as the, moon, as the sun moves off to the left. And uh, so in a, in a similar way, we see uh, from the moon the way we see the moon from Earth and where we started. Um, Jackie, I'm not sure if there are any other questions. I guess we need to end the broadcast, but thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, thank you everybody. And be sure to tune in next week for another field trip, uh, this time through multiple data sets. Great. Oh, and yes, Car uh, Micah is making sure we remember um, we usually have a quiz for you at the end of this, but we don't today. Instead, we ask if you could just fill out a survey so that we know how the program is, um, is who it's reaching and how it's reaching you in ways that we could improve it for the future. So the link will come up. It'll be in the chat and it'll probably show up on the screen in just a sec. So I encourage you to fill that out and join us again for these great live presentations. Really, and uh, that does help us craft uh, uh, to your needs as well. 
uh, especially at these times when we're all home and hopefully uh, enjoying this together. Thank you very much.